CNT has all your favorite movies. Wednesday at 9 Eastern, it's the smash hit movie, Bad Girls. Car Wash Fundraiser, Message of Hope. May not be suitable for all viewers. This is CNT. Tonight, a major TV event. Part one of the story of a remote Dutch trading post that would become the armpit of the world. It captured our imagination and held our dreams close to its breasts, gently drowning us in a milky discharge. It is the site of some of mankind's most grandiose achievements and also our society's most squalid and depraved debaucheries. A history of liberty. Major support for this documentary is brought to you by the Bank of Liberty and the Public Broadcasting Corporation, where our budget is cut every year to pay for more bombs. If you take a look at the microcosm that is Liberty City, millions of people, a collective consciousness but utterly alone in a crowd, a million souls crying out to be heard, piled on top of each other like kittens in a bag all wanting to kill each other or suck from society's teat. It is a city with so much history. It is the history of the modern world, particularly for people who can't use a map and like sweeping generalizations. A history of decadence, a history of corruption, a history of liberty. On September 4th, 1609, Horatio Humboldt, an English explorer hired by the Dutch to find a new place to sell weed, steered his trusty ship into the mouth of a great river, the Humboldt, which he wrote in his log. It is a strange and fortuitous coincidence that lush future site of commerce coincidentally shares the same name as me, for the locals call it the Humboldt. Honestly. That being said, looking through contemporary journals, even then the Humboldt River was 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 a polluted mess. The Chickasaka Indians would shit and, and, and piss right in the river. It wasn't safe to swim in. With that knowledge, it makes it much easier to ignore the awful genocide and epic larceny our forefathers committed and talk about big ideas in grandiose terms and hope we get book deals. Horatio Humboldt had stumbled into the natural harbor that would become the greatest sociological experiment the world had ever seen, to determine if all the people in the world could live together in a single place. The answer is, of course, no. Liberty City was founded by the Dutch, and all the Dutch cared about was appearing to be purveyors of liberal values. But all they really cared about was pimping women and getting high. They were, in effect, well, I guess the first rappers. They wanted to find a place where they could party and kill people. Knowing this, it does make the act of highway robbery that our forefathers committed with regards to the Dutch a lot easier to forget, and, and we simply mask it in patriotic foundation myths. Unlike other cities in the New World, founded to facilitate new forms of religious persecution by lunatics who'd been run out of Europe by liberals, Liberty City was founded not to promote religious intolerance, but instead the other central tenant of Western European society, getting rich off of other people's work. You have to understand that when the Europeans arrived, uh, the people that met them were savages. Can you imagine landing in a foreign land and being surrounded by men in loincloths? It's sort of hard to concentrate on fending off bubonic plague or, or sleeping with your pretty little 14-year-old wife when there are savages with no clothes running around. Luckily, we had a few tricks up our sleeve for dealing with them. When Liberty City was founded at the beginning of the modern age, it quickly expanded its ego and learned to hate everyone else. Cities that were 3,000 years old couldn't hold a candle to the undisputed, self-appointed capital of the world. 
Oh, the maps were really, really shitty back then. I mean, I don't know if it was the drink or the scurvy or the raging syphilis passed about by the town bike, but look at this map! It's like a Spaniard with polio painted it. It's one of the reasons people took so long to get anywhere. I mean, I mean, the shitty maps. The other reason was the savages. <clears throat> Advertisements were sent back to Europe, promising settlers a new life in a new city that had 24-hour convenience stores, roller coasters, and the entertainment of a nightly hanging at the gallows. All the things civilization had brought to bear on this land. All of Europe wanted to come see what freedom was really like. When they arrived, they were aghast at America's new pastime, watching animals fuck and betting on it. Uh, I, yes, well, this truly was the city of the future. Word spread, so did the settlement. They chose the slender island in the bay, which they called Algonquin, after the old Indian word algon ku win thought by some to mean place for condo skyscraper, and by others as island to catch an STD. In 1625, right after the colony was founded, the first ship of slaves arrived to give the hard-working, morally upstanding, non-hypocritical Americans, newly free from the tyranny of Europe, time to focus on important things in life, like yelling at their women for buying too much shit in the strip mall. The new economy was a boom. It was very different from failed Jamestown, where a bunch of incest-loving cannibals consumed each other in an orgiastic fury of self-important nonsense. Although the exact nature of the differences escapes me just at the moment. But regardless, Liberty City gave the white settlers plenty of time to focus on the important things, like, um, getting laid. The slave craze was huge. It was like, uh, waiting for a new iFruit phone to come out. People would line up at the docks and wait in line for days to own their very own person, and then put them online for a higher price. Some dissenters wondered about the moral consequences of a nation founded on genocide, slavery, and theft, but they were quickly imprisoned as being unpatriotic by proto-chicken hawks. Of course, we have very different values now. That year, all the local indigenous tribes were brought together and paid for what would be the greatest real estate deal in the history of the world. 14,000 acres of prime downtown real estate for some spare change, a porno magazine, and front row tickets for a game of cricket. Cricket is the most boring game ever. What do the British know about sports? They're all gay. The Dutch had a land of plenty. They traded beaver skins, a 17th century version of wife swapping, and partied late into the night. But founding a country on getting shit-faced and working slaves was trouble from the start. It hadn't worked for the Greeks, and it wouldn't work for the Dutch. 4,000 miles from home and no internet connection to read up on soccer scores, the populace became disenchanted. The colony's deep-seated racism and love of 24-hour shopping would begin to prove to be its undoing. What happens when you take a whole chicken, pack it full of mashed potatoes, top it full of gravy, insert some corn, then deep fry it? You've got yourself a meal. The all-new Stuff Pollo Total Frito, now at Cluck and Bell. The meal in one just got massive. Cluck and Bell. Liberty City, you don't need money to drive away at Sully's. How about the Ferracci? Here's a fine racing machine for you. There's been a lot of special moments in this beauty. So special, there was an Amber Alert issued. They never found her, but it's yours for $7,999. Enjoy the power of the open road today. Oh boy, Sully's got a nice one for you here. The Emperor, fast as hell. And the airbags have been successfully tested by the previous three owners. None of them are in the state to drive anymore, so the car is yours now for the low price of $12,999. Sully's has trucks too. The EXT, 
Nothing makes you feel manly like driving a truck covered in another man's blood. It's got dark upholstery that doesn't show stains. It's a forensics dream. We call it the Science of Crime Special. Only $10,499. Head down to Sully's Auto Mart right now. These and other bargains are going fast. Remember, Sully says it's pre-owned. It's not used. Liberty City, a town on the edge, a town at the daybreak of dawn, a city at the gate of the universe, a city at the limit of metaphor, deep into the point where hyperbole becomes gibberish. The gateway to the new world was also a terrifying den of iniquity, and the campaign to clean up Liberty City and shut down the Comatoriums began almost as soon as the city was founded. What most people don't know, but what I discovered through extensive reenactments, uh, purely for research, of course, was that in the Comatoriums, they used pig fat as lubrication, which in many ways is far superior to modern-day petroleum jelly. Another thing worth bearing in mind is that in the spring of 1647, the East India Trading Company hired a cross-dressing director general for New Rotterdam named uh, Gloria Hole. He had lost his right leg in an unfortunate industrial accident while preaching the good word to some savages by, uh, you know, blowing them up with a cannon, which backfired. Puritanical and self-righteous, he had orders to return civility and productivity to the colony. Within weeks, he had banned drinking, smoking, fornicating with Indians, Texas Hold'em, missing church, anal beads, laughter, and imposed strict fines for male camel toe and whistling in public. It wasn't well received. The city was burned to the ground. Within a few years, New Rotterdam had become so diverse that the Dutch had become a minority in their own colony. Then, just like today, nobody paid attention to the Dutch and only passed through to get stoned or screw a hooker while pretending that they were going there to look at the depressing paintings and smelly stagnant waterways and wooden shoes. Diversity was troubling. And with diversity comes chaos as we know to our peril today. Nietzsche said that, and he was so clever, he ended up in a lunatic asylum. Then, leaders began to fear the worst. They were totally petrified of the Jews showing up. Taxes were reduced so everyone could afford their own firearm. And um, a pattern for the country was now set in stone. Ignorant, scared xenophobes armed to the teeth trying to protect their borders. <sighs> It's always been a great nation. What? I'm not racist. On August 27th, 1664, heavily armed British warships entered the harbor. The colonists signed a petition requesting to be ruled by the British so they wouldn't have to brush their teeth any longer and could be certain they were better than everyone else. The English quickly renamed New Rotterdam Liberty City after a generous donation by the Bank of Liberty for sponsorship rights. Every single place the British population went, the invisible hand of God prepared space for them by, well, you know, conveniently destroying and eradicating the native population. Soon the colony expanded, and areas were named after heavily inbred members of their Germanic royal family. Broker was named after Sir William Broker III, the king's bastard son, who was conceived by a milkmaid. The region to its north was called Dukes after the word Dukey, as the people in the area smelled like shit. The peninsula to the north of that was named Bohan, after Bohan, a Dutch word meaning Dutch word. And the area across the river was dubbed Alderney, after Philip de Alderney who was the only person who could tolerate living in an oily, mosquito-filled swamp full of industrial wastelands and soccer mounds. But things wouldn't be quiet for long. Pretty soon, the residents of Liberty City began to fight with the British over taxes. Americans felt, and what rightly so, that they shouldn't have to pay any taxes. Let the market sort it out. Poor people will die, rich people will win. Welcome to progress. And so began the American Revolution, 
a bloody battle by men and women who wanted to leave the tyranny of England's tax structure that paid for burdensome health care and unnecessary public education. This was a war agitated by a number of musket companies who knew they would win whatever the outcome. And of course you can still see that rich tradition today. Americans don't want health care or education. No, no, we want guns and fireworks shows and wars so politicians can invest in armament companies and clean up. And of course we want drugs. Oh, yes, lots of those. Strong ones you take with young coeds when discussing their thesis <laughs> and then begin to rub their thighs while they say, didn't I hear you on that documentary? And you whisper to them until they pass out. Uh, uh, but I digress. The American Revolution was bloody. Soon the French joined in the war to help the struggling American insurgency. <laughs> no, they did not. Yes, they did. They joined in by sending a big statue, which won us the war when the British all died laughing at a giant Martian transvestite eating an ice cream cone. Whatever! We saved their asses in WW2. Get me some freedom fries! The Revolutionary War quickly ended. Residents pulled down the statue of King George and melted it into gold chains, gold teeth, and golden toilet seats. The Union Jack was taken down in Liberty City, replaced with the Stars and Stripes, and the newly liberated Americans celebrated. Soon this entrepreneurial spirit took hold, and Liberty City was unstoppable. Yes, although they were free, the people lived in squalor. You could buy a young boy on the streets for, um, you know, a few pence. It was a great time to be in the top 5% of the population. <sighs> it was a great time to be white. Yes, but soon meddlers like Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson came in to change the successful agrarian-based slave economy to one of excessive service fees for concert tickets and huge turnpike tolls. With slavery soon outlawed in Liberty City and the other northern colonies, righteous women were forced to spend time under the train tracks, servicing men for three pence. Mm. You could get your knob slob for less than the price of a donut. It was a nation on the up. The politicians were having a field day. You couldn't get them to vote because they were all out having their knobs slobbed. To keep the country moving forward, the capital of the nation was moved from Liberty City to a malaria swamp on the banks of the Potomac, miles to the south. Thankfully, the politicians moved out of Liberty City, and the stage was set for organized crime and mobs to really make a difference. The city soon became, well, a microcosm of all the contrasting elements of modern life. Palaces, self-extravagance, squalor, tenements, trannies, men, women, and children crowded together like a nest of cockroaches. Just like the Liberty City of today, only with less rich hedge fund dorks trying to be homeboys. With tensions rising and civil war on the horizon, Frederico Fitzpatrick planned to head off and teach the South a lesson. But before doing so, continued his great project to bring calm and civilization to all a central repository for the most hopeless specimens of degraded humanity to get high in. A park in the middle of Liberty City that would become the great democratic meeting ground where, no matter how rich or how poor, you could get dragged into the bushes and raped. Ah! Yet beyond its tranquil borders, tension was breaking out. A lot of people were tired of living in black and white. They wanted color, and there were riots. There were kids, kids sleeping in the streets, begging, willing to do anything for a nickel. And there were no taboos or TV shows to catch you doing what is natural between a man and a boy. The nation was sliding inexorably into civil war, which we'll leave until next time. Unless you have the foresight to pre-order the box set of DVDs, Join us next time for a history of liberty, part two, the Civil War and beyond.
CMT Wednesday nights this fall. Don't miss the return of Funeral Factor, American Asshole, and a whole new shitty singer competition. This is CMT. My name is Brian O'Toole. As a kid, I always wanted to make a difference in my community, and I didn't read so good. Most careers were closed to me. That's why I joined the LCPD. Now I'm on the front lines, helping tourists right and fighting terrorists. I rifle through people's bags on the subway to protect freedom. I arrest protesters at political conventions for straying outside the free speech zone. We vigorously enforce the open container law and aggressively protect the environment. Maybe you love car chases just like on TV. Imagine being able to do that every day. I'm protecting freedom, whatever the cost. I'm a hero, and I know it. <laughs>